Hi there and welcome to Money Talks, where we take a look at the rural economy as it affects you in the ag sector. In this edition, it's payday for those 35,000 beleaguered investors in South Canterbury Finance as the government rides to the rescue. What's John Key's payout going to mean for our economy? And why is the Serious Fraud Office now launched an investigation into Alan Hubbard's failed company and threatened to put one of our guests in jail? Can the lucrative Fonterra payout to dairy farmers lift the rural property market out of its two-year slump? And will wealth creation really be easier in 2011? Analysis from an expert who tells us what sectors will perform best not to be missed. All this and much, much more coming up. But first, the latest global dairy trade auction results just in will be of special interest given the recent strengthening in other U.S. dollar commodity prices. Joining us with all the up-to-date auction information is ASB Rural Economist James Shortle. James, thanks for being here. Always good to be here. So what are the overnight results showing? It wasn't fantastic, was it? Well, prices were down slightly. Um, to be honest, they're not down uh, in a big way. So I still think that, that, that prices at, the, at these levels are uh, still really positive. So on a trade-weighted basis, um, the, the products came down by 2.5%, skim milk powder down, down the most. Um, and probably when you, when you consider the different contract periods, then the near-term contract was, uh, was probably the softest. Overall, how's the dairy sector tracking? Oh, very well. I mean, when you, even though prices have probably been a little bit softer over the past sort of uh, four weeks to six weeks, um, they've tracked back only sort of one, two, three percent in general. Um, and when you look at, at prices at the at the current levels, and they're very, very high on a, on a historic basis. Um, you know, whole milk powder sort of trading between you know sort of three and a half thousand US dollars per ton. Um, that's a that's a product that uh, you know sort of prior to 2007 was was trading sort of 1800 US dollars per ton. So, you know, these are big increases, and even though we might see a bit of playing around the margins, then um, you know I'm still really positive about where prices are right now. How are our neighbors? Do in the Aussie dairy farmers. Apparently, they got a problem with locusts. Yeah, well, I guess that's impacting on all sorts of different uh, products in Australia, particularly in the wheat market. But uh, you know, I, I guess the, the dairy farmers in Australia, the, the, their biggest problem right now is probably the, the Australian dollar. Uh, with with it, the levels that it's at right now, then that's that's really going to be hurting uh, the agricultural sector in Australia, and um, you know, it might even open up, open up some opportunities for us. Now, the U.S. Do, uh, the, the Aussie dollar hit parity last week. Uh, what do you think they'd be saying across the ditch and around the world? Oh, they won't be very happy. Uh, but there was, you know, they popped a few corks, I guess. I mean, it's always good to, um, it's going to always good to to hit parity with the U.S. dollar, and, it, and it's a real, um, you know, sort of indi a good indicator of the strength of the Australian economy and uh, and where things are going, the outlook. So, um, the Australian dollar hitting hitting parity, it's it's trying, to, it's tried to bump through that um, that one dollar mark, uh, sort of part of last week, couldn't quite get there, and then Friday night managed to get through so um, that's been the talk of the town but of course it's weakened quite a bit since then. And our own dollar of course has been tracking up as well. Yeah the, the New Zealand dollar against the US uh, was trading up around 76 and a half um, for part of last week which um, you know is very very high levels. Um, it has since tracked back um, you know overnight there's been some some news out of China um, about the People's Bank of China increasing their interest rates and that's really an attempt to try and um, sort of uh, decrease in inflation and, and put a bit of a, a dampener on their housing market which has really been steaming through uh, over the past sort of six to, to twelve months so um, you know that could have a bit of an impact on on the global environment and as a result the US dollar has been back in favour so you know the Australian dollar we talked about that um, up around uh, at parity over the the weekend it's now trading at 97 and a half uh, the Kiwi dollar has lost about two cents since last week and now it's uh, it's trading around 74 and a half against the US so it's been a lot of activity in currency markets and overall share markets around the globe have been pretty positive uh, looking to the US of course to find out uh, how much more stimulus is coming on board what are you hearing yeah well, it's interesting because usually when when there's um, you know some bad economic data then that's bad news for, for equity markets but perhaps over the last couple of weeks when we've seen some uh, some bad economic data then it's 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 meant that there's been more speculation that, got, that the US economy is going to get more help. So equities have actually gone up. But um, actually last week there, there was some more positive uh, results. Retail sales out of the US was a little bit better than expected. Um, so that provided a boost to, to equities. And uh, we're now starting to get into the third quarter of their earnings season. Now our New Zealand inflation rates are out. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, it's a key indicator for the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. They, um, you know, they, they're really trying to control inflation. Um, 
with the official cash rate and their target band is between 1 and 3%. So um, inflation uh, came out on Monday and that showed that annual inflation is, uh, is at 1.5%. So that's the lowest level it's been since 2004. That's, um, you know, that sort of indicates that things are pretty soft um, and that uh, you know, your, your general retailers find it pretty hard to increase prices. It's, there's just not... Um, you know, sort of the demand out there. So, uh, you know, in context, that that is at very low levels. It's right within where the, um, the Reserve Bank sort of wants it. But we do start to, we are picking that inflation. It's going to start picking up now, um, and it and it's going to because of, you know, we've got in increases in GST, the emissions trading scheme, other government-related items. That's going to weigh on those. And also, well. James, what the heck's it going to mean for uh, interest rates? Yeah, well, we, I mean, of course, the Reserve Bank, they've got their target range. Um, inflation's right within the, at the lower end of that range. So, um, you know, we it sort of came in a little bit higher than their expectations, but we still think that um, the official cash rate and interest rates in general are going to be low for a while to come. So the, uh, the OCR currently at 3%. Um, we don't see that there's going to be any major reason for that uh, or any need for that to, to change until um, the early part of next year through to about March of 2011. Um, so really interest rates, uh, longer term interest rates are, are at low levels right now. Good to hear. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, why the National Business Review's editor thinks wealth creation will be easier in 2011. Neville Gibson shares his inside knowledge about what sectors will be hot or not. And what's the latest with South Canterbury Finance and the giant government payout to all those investors? Is your wallet feeling $1.25 billion lighter this week? And wine wars. How about that takeover play launched by delegate against Oyster Bay? What could it mean for its primo brand overseas? But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How much accrued interest will taxpayers have to stump up to pay out those SCF investors in addition to their original principal? The answer right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how much accrued interest will taxpayers have to stump up to pay out those South Canterbury Finance investors in addition to their principal? The answer, 3% interest will come out of our pockets to top up those SCF investors. That's the current official cash rate, paid out as of August 30th. Now, it's a huge day. South Canterbury Finance's 35,000 investors are now being reimbursed in full, almost two months after the Timaru base firm collapsed. And now it turns out we'll continue to fork out more taxpayer dollars as we now have to fund a new investigation just launched by the Serious Fraud Office into the troubled company. To find out the latest, we're joined by the editor of the National Business Review, Neville Gibson. Neville, what's the Hyatt Regency Hotel got to do with this SCF stuff? Well, this was one of the first really big bad deals that South Canterbury Finance did when they got out of their core lending to the farming sector and got into bed with uh, hotel developers and others. And you're talking well over $40 million. And there was no way that the people who had borrowed that money could pay it back. So effectively, there was a receivership of the Hyatt. South Canterbury Finance then were looking around what they, what they could do to um, get that money back. Well, they wouldn't get the money back, but what they were going to do to keep financing it. And basically, I think from then on, it was all downhill. Now, as a result of your investigations, you may now have to go to jail or pay thousands of dollars of fines. Bring us up to speed. Well, this is a, the uh, really tough section of the Serious Fraud Office uh, Act. And uh, yes, they can demand this of anybody who doesn't give them documents they want in relation to deals that they're investigating. So the SFO came to you and said, you people have to turn over, National Business Review, your documents and audio recordings about this story you've been investigating or you could be punished. Yes, we did an interview with, uh, with a person who was related to the chairman of the company who was a former meat worker who was actually undergoing medical uh, treatment who ended up as owner of the Hyatt worth well over $40 million. Did, he have, any, did he have any business uh, acumen? No, and uh, on the surface, it looks like this could be a kind of smoking gun if the Serious Fraud Office are interested in looking into these related party dealings where companies are basically lending money to and from each other within the same group, that this could be defrauding. And if you look at it in retrospect, defrauding the taxpayer that's where the money, you know, the 1.2 billion or 4 billion, depending on which way you're calculating it, that the taxpayers had to pay out under the guarantee deposit scheme. 
And Neville, here's my question to you. Ironically, this has all come out just as their government is about to pay out $1.25 billion to the taxpayers. Should the government hold off that payment? Well, I think it's too late. It's certainly the timing's interesting, but our stories have been published over the last two weeks. Obviously, the serious fraud officer are investigating some part of Alan Hubbard's empire, but they announced yesterday at the same time they served us with the notice that they were going to widen that in inquiry out to uncover... Uh, these related party transactions within the South Canterbury Finance Group. It's interesting, James. Treasury has raised the specter that perhaps um, uh, the government could have put South Canterbury Finance a long time ago under statutory management. They didn't have to wait till receivership. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I guess they were trying to work through some of the issues and to, uh, you know, to try and find a, a successful outcome for uh, the country, for the taxpayer, for everyone involved. And... Um, you know, I guess that was going to buy them a little bit more time, um, but it does seem like there's you know, a few things coming out of the wash and you know, time will tell what that sort of means, I guess. Neville, what's happening now with the rest of the investigations into Alan Hubbard's many companies, uh, several of which are under statutory management? Well, those investigations are still going on and they will result, presumably, in some form of prosecution by the look of it. I mean, we've chatted to the serious fraud office, but they're not saying very much on the record about uh, these investigations, fair enough. Uh, apparently now, Neville, it's going to take, I've read, up to four years before the government can close the file on SCF and begin to recoup some of that $1.6 billion. Uh, seems like an awfully long time, doesn't it? Four years could be too, too short, I think. Really? I mean, it's the uh, JBL, for example, which collapsed well over 20, possibly 30 years ago, uh, it's still under some form of statutory management. These things have got a long tail. But they are going to be selling some of these businesses within the next week. So there are some businesses within the South Canterbury Finance Group. Because the efforts to prop it up meant drawing in some of the other Hubbard companies like Scales and so on, which own orchards and are quite profitable. So who's likely to snap up those assets in the next week? Well, what are you picking? Well, 150 applications according to the receivers, so that it could be anybody. Uh, what are you picking? Uh, <laughs> I think in, well... Some of the hardest ones, like orchards and that sort of thing, these are very low value, uh, low yielding uh, interest, but obviously uh, some of the more profitable companies, uh, Scales is very profitable, will go there, although it is quite a big investor in the rural area. Neville, the uh, New Zealand dollar may be death to exporters, but is it good if you want to snap up some overseas shares? What do you make of it? It certainly is. Yeah, I mean, this, this, uh, the brittle economy could be well and truly over by about next March, I think. You know, there's always people get really bad and they start uh, saying we need interventions and you know, the market economics don't work. That's usually at the bottom of the cycle and I think we're probably just starting to come out of it. You can see it in retailing. Uh, the retailers have been sitting on their hands. They haven't been marketing a lot. They're just waiting for that turn. And uh, I've been told it could be as early as November. There could be quite a big pre-Christmas one. Others are saying about February because uh, there's pent-up demand. People don't stop buying shoes and clothes and food. And uh, when they've got, they feel they've got the tax cuts and that really hasn't started to come through, it's going to be huge. And a lot of those uh, inflationary things that James talked about earlier, ETS, those sort of things, well... Economically speaking, they, um, they're a cost on everybody, but they're not really a fundamental in the economy. Well,